Shalom, shalom. How are you all doing? God bless you all this evening, this morning, wherever you are. As you come on and as you watch this, there's something that I want to discuss, and that is a very controversial topic. It has been discussed throughout the ages, probably. Uh, and I'm saying probably from the time of Yeshua, uh, especially when you come into the era of the new covenant and what many believe as relates once saved, always saved. And so I want to talk about this uh, because from a Hebrew uh, perspective, uh, a lot of times when uh, we discuss this topic, especially coming from a Christianized or Christianity point of view, or let's just even say a Westernized point of view, this concept of once saved, always saved has its root. But from a Hebrew, all right, mindset, from an Israelite mindset, and from a biblical mindset, all right, we're talking about from God, we're talking about from Yahshua, and we're talking about the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Godhead, they have something different to say about this very subject. Once saved, always saved. So what I want to do is allow the scriptures in connection to the Godhead, which who inspired the scripture, right? Let them give us the answer unequivocally to this very subject. Because again, it's been argued about down through the ages, clearing up into our time. And so I want to allow the scriptures to speak and that we can put this to rest once and for all. Now, of course, I know there may be some rebuttals. I know there will be others that say, no, this is not how it is. And that because, again, from a Christianity, 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 Christianity point of view, it is believed, you know, once Yahshua came and he died on the cross, he resurrected, of course, you know, he died for the sins of the world, then we have nothing else to do but accept his death, burial, and resurrection, and then we are saved, and basically the work is done. It's over with. Well, let's just see what the scripture says in relationship to once we are, let's just say, once we're saved, right? We receive Yahshua, we have accepted salvation. Let's see what the scripture says, and guess what? We're gonna start right out swinging okay we're not going to build up to this we're going to start straight out swinging going straight to the scripture and we want to see exactly what the scripture has to say all right so let's start straight from the book of revelation and again we're going to start swinging so again remember we're going to talk about this from the godhead in other words the father son the holy ghost and let's see what they have to say about this very thing all right revelation chapter 3 verse 5 and I'm gonna try not to try to interpret this. I, I want the scripture to interpret itself because a lot of times that's where we begin to get in trouble because we try to uh, interpret. And I'm not saying that we're wrong, especially when we got the Holy Spirit to interpret scripture, all right? But the scripture can interpret itself. Holy Spirit, now if you have the Holy Spirit, of course, Holy Spirit can inspire the scripture and there are some things that can he can point out to you personally for your own life, for your own personal walk and your own personal journey. But in this particular topic, this particular subject, it is so valuable that we allow the scripture to speak to us. So people won't be mis, uh, people won't be uh, mishandling the scripture and people won't be lost because they thought all the time that, okay, Jesus died for me. I'm good, just believe and just live my life basically any kind of way I want to live it. You know, Jesus already died for me. There's no more work. There's nothing for me to do. Okay, well, let's just see what the scripture has to say. And starting at Revelation chapter three, verse five, look at what it says. 
He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in right raiment. First of all, scripture says we have to overcome something. Now you have to go back and read uh, the verses coming into that. I would encourage you to start at verse one and read into verse five. And again, we don't have the exact uh, time to do all that because I want this video to kind of be short, but read into it and you'll see what it is that these people in the book of Revelation concerning this particular church in this particular verse, what do they have to overcome? All right, that would be very important for us to go and check out. But here is something I highlighted and I want you to see. And he says, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Wait a minute, you mean to tell me there's a name that has been put in the book of life? Now, if your name is in the book of life, apparently, you have attached yourself to Jesus Christ because he's the only one that can put your name in the Lamb's book of life, right? He's the only one that can do that because you have believed in the Lamb of God. So therefore now your name is inscribed. Now there's something about your name being put in the book of life that is really deeper than what I have time to talk about right now. So I don't want to even say it because if I say it, I really have to do a deep dive with you. And that's not what I'm calling myself to do this session. All right. Maybe we'll talk about it later about your name being inscribed in the book of life before you even got here on the planet. So for your name to be blotted out, see, God has already predestined you to be saved. You have already been predestined. Okay. But you have to choose that destination. So in other words, your life has already been predestined or there is a destiny that has been already given to you and your name was written in the book of life. But in order for you to get sustained in that book, you must accept Messiah, especially when you come into the knowledge of understanding right from wrong, understanding and old enough and mature enough to understand that Messiah is the Messiah, all right? But again, that's a deep dive that I'm not gonna go into right now. But the point is, I will not block out his name out of the book of life. So that means your name can be blotted out, all right? That means your name have to be put in there for it to be blotted out, all right? So that tells me right there that salvation, if you have received it, you can lose it, all right? We started again, I said, straight out of the gate. First verse, you can be blotted out if you don't overcome. So there's something that we must overcome. The trials, the tests, the temptations that we will face, okay? But it says, but I will confess his name before my father and before the angel. Now, keep in mind, this is in red, so Yahshua is the one quoting this. All right, let's go on to the next verse. Now, let's go into the Old Testament because what Yahshua is saying is not something that is just now coming into play. This is something that was also brought and talked about in the Psalms. Psalm 69, 28 to be exact. And it says, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Again, we see the same concept that your name have to be in the book if it's gonna be blotted out of the book, okay? So that tells you that something is taking place whereby a person was put in the book, who was written down, but because they had turned, because they had went into another direction, other than the predestined direction, Therefore, their name can be blotted out of the book of the living. In other words, it says here, and not be written with the righteous. So that lets you know that whoever's name is written in the book, it is because they have been living according to righteousness. And we know Yahshua is the standard for righteousness, okay? Remember, in Romans chapter 10, we we have not went about to establish our own righteousness, right? So Romans 10 talks about there is a people, Hebrews or Israelites, who had not accepted the righteousness of God, which was Messiah. There, was, there were many 
in the day of Yahshua that did accept Yahshua. We know the 12 disciples, except for Judas, which we're going to talk about in this same lesson later on. We know Paul, we know 3,000, we know 5,000, and so on and so on. It kept adding to the church, all right, as such as to be saved. Remember, there is another scripture that talks about that the angels of God are sent to those who are heirs unto salvation. So that lets you know that there are people who are supposed to receive salvation. So angels are sent, all right, to minister to those. Is what the scripture actually says. Angels are sent to those who are heirs, all right, sent to minister to those who are heirs unto salvation meaning perhaps they have not received it yet and so the angel is ministering to them and that ministering can come in many different ways right many different ways that ministry of angels can come okay whether that be you know in a dream at night maybe there's a dream given to these individuals uh maybe there's something that happens in the individual's life that the angel is the cause of it to bring them to the place of thinking about salvation, thinking about Yahshua. But moving on, I want to stay with this subject of blotting out the name, all right? Watch what it says. Now, it goes even back further. We can also see this in the book of Exodus, in the Torah, in the Torah, which is a, which means Torah simply means pointing to a certain direction, it is also uh, meaning teaching, all right? So the Torah is pointing us to something. It's a teacher of righteousness. In this verse, in Exodus 32, of course, this is Moses, okay? And again, he's getting this revelation from God, or he's getting this insight from God, okay? So we see Yahshua speaking about it. We see in the Psalms uh, writing about it. So we, <clears throat> David and then we also see here Moses writing about it, and he's getting this from God. So let's look at Exodus chapter 32, and we want to look at verse 32, all right? Exodus 32, verse 32, and also verse 33. Watch what it says. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, lock me out, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. So God has written a book. And the names are already written in that book who are destined for salvation, okay? But the names can be blotted out, okay? Now, let's go on. But listen what the Lord says. Here's what God says. So that means, again, Yahshua talks about this. God talks about this. The Father, look at what he says in verse 33 of Exodus. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever have sinned, against me him will i blot out of my book what so you mean to tell me sinful activity okay and i will say constant sinful activity that shows that this person has turned from god that means they were in the book but they had a continual lifestyle of sinning so therefore their name is blotted out. That means they have turned from God. They have left the way of righteousness. In other words, they have left the way that was predestined, right? Predestined or a predestination that they should walk in or that they should come to. So God had predestined these individuals, people, nations to go into a certain direction. And that direction is the way of righteousness. It's the way of truth. It's the way of godliness or godlikeness. It's the way of holiness, right? But they chose to go another way. Now, let's go on. Let's go on. Let's go on. Uh, let's look at another verse. Okay, let's go to another verse that I think is also important. We want, we're going to go, <coughs> we want to go now to uh, the New Testament again, and let's get some things that the apostles written in connection to, all right, turning from the way of righteousness, meaning that perhaps these individuals was once 
walking with the Lord and they was connected to God. And all of a sudden something took place where they began to turn and go another direction. All right. In the direction that is not destination for a person of salvation. So let's look at second Peter chapter two, verse 20. It says, for if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through, all right, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Yeshua the Christ or Jesus Christ. All right. So that means they have escaped the pollution. How? How do you, how? he tells you, Peter tells us how you escape the pollution of the world. As you re, as you receive the knowledge of the Lord, his death, burial, and resurrection, or the knowledge of his salvation, the knowledge of the gospel, the knowledge of the kingdom, all right? The knowledge of the person of Yahshua and who he represented because he showed us the father, right? He says, you escape that by that knowledge and receiving that, here's what he says. They are in entangled they're in and take of their end to what? The, the pollution of the world and overcome by that pollution of the world. Their latter end is worse than them that, I'm sorry, it says the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Meaning that in the beginning, they were lost. They found Messiah, but then they turn around back to the pollution of the world, he said, it's going to be worse because they turn back to the pollution of the world. Now we know that Peter also goes and talks about this aspect of like a dog turning back to his vomit, right? Turning back to the vomit, uh, or there's another passage that talks about a pig, right? Going back to the slop. So that's basically what, what is being said is that when we who once was entangled in the world and entangled with pollution and entangled with the flesh and entangled with uh, the darkness and evil and even the devil himself, and then we get snatched out of that life, we come out of that, translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, Okay, but then all of a sudden we get re-entangled with that and not only entangled, but we are overcome by it. See, it's one thing to be entangled and then overcome. He says, entangled again and overcome. Sometimes, you know, we can get a little bit of dirt on us, but we can be washed. Why? Because we repent, all right? We repent and we say, hey, Lord, we got entangled, we're sorry and we repent and we don't go that way again. But this scripture in Peter says here that we are entangled in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, and then overcome, okay? And then it says again, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. All right, so let's go on. Now, again, from a Hebraic mindset, Okay, from a Hebrew mindset, which I subscribe to, it is different from the Christianized point of view. Because the Christianized point of view, depending on what sect and what church, all right, what root background you're coming from, they believe once saved, always saved. But again, now we're reading this from the Holy Bible. All right. And I, let me just say this. We're reading from the Holy Scriptures. Let me say it that way. From the Holy Scripture. OK, so from that, from the Holy Scripture standpoint, it, it, it's not biased. OK, it's not biased to a Christianized mindset. OK, nor is it nor is it biased to a Hebrew mindset, because sometimes even those who are Hebrews have a different different focus and a different interpretation that's not in line with the Holy Scripture. But we're allowing the scripture to dictate the revelation, all right, to give us the understanding and the clarity about this once saved, always saved. And this is why we have people in the world who claim to be Christians, but yet their lives are not in a line with a lifestyle 
that is holy and righteous. In other words, the Bible says that God is coming back from a church and the word church there does not give you a connotation of a Christianized front. The word church is ecclesia, but if you run that word back to the old covenant, it is kahal, which means assembly. It, it means a multitude. In the first place that word is used is in Genesis chapter 28, verse 3. Okay, when you have the, the Jacob and Isaac, all right, Jacob is getting ready to go to uh, 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 Paran Aram. Okay, Isaac is telling him to go there and, and he's giving him the blessing of his father Abraham and he's saying that God is going to make you a multitude of people and that word uh, assembly of people and the word assembly there is the word kahal which is translated in the Greek tongue as ekklesia. So the church which is used in the New Testament as the word church ekklesia is already being used in the Old Covenant. So a lot of people want to say, well, the, the church was birthed at or in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit came. No, the church was already. Look, here's what I interpret that. And I believe this is the Hebrew understanding of that. No, the church was already in the wilderness. According to Acts, the church was already in the wilderness. But then if we go all the way to Genesis, we see that the word again is already mentioned in the book of Genesis, chapter 28, verse 3, in connection to Abraham, in connection to Isaac, in connection to Jacob, in the seed that's going to come through Jacob, meaning Yahshua, okay? Now, when we get to Acts, a lot of people say the church was born in the book of Acts, chapter 2, because of the Holy Spirit. No, what I say, the church was empowered at that time. The church was already in the Old Covenant. Okay, the assembly, right? The congregation was already in the old covenant. Okay, Hebrew Israelites were already called the congregation. They were already called the assembly. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? So when we get into the New Testament, Acts chapter two, who was there? It was the Israelites who were there. All right, now they had some proselytes and they had some com uh, converts when you read the book of Acts chapter two, okay, they were there, but the multitude of people that were there were Hebrew, were Israelite that were coming from all these different nations that they have been scattered to. And so what happened is God empowered his people at that time. He empowered the Hebrew Israelites at that time. So it wasn't a church being birthed. No, it was a church being empowered. Okay, now I know I kind of took a rabbit trail there, but let's get back to our point. One save, always save. Now, since I just mentioned that, so let's just look at this Hebrew Gentile situation in the book of Romans where Paul is writing to uh, the Gentiles and the Hebrews that were there in Rome. And so we come to this place in, Re in Romans chapter 11, and I want to start at verse 18, all right, but we're going to verse 22. But it says, again, it's talking again to Hebrews and the Gentiles, okay, or Israelites, all right, and the Gentiles, or the circumcision and the uncircumcised, or in the New Testament, the Jew and the Gentile, all right? Here we go. It says, boast not against the branches, but if thy boast, thou beareth not the root, but the root bears thee. Now he's talking to the Gentiles. Now again, you got to go up and read the whole chapter. I would encourage you because he's saying to the Gentiles, don't you boast because you are grafted in to this olive tree. And he's going to begin to talk about being cut off. Okay. Now, wait a minute. You mean you can be cut off? Yes, cut off. Cut off meaning that you are inside of the root. You are part of the root. And we know even in the book of Matthews, uh, the, uh, the prophet John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist talked about the ax is laid to the root of the tree, meaning that it's about to be cut off, okay? And that he 
all those stones that was out there as he was baptizing them, God was telling him, I'm able to take these stones, right? And put them and grab them in into this tree that had, okay, that's that, could, that I can connect them to Abraham through my life, through the blessing or the covenant of the oath that I made with Abraham. But let's go on. Let's get, let's get back. Watch this now. He says uh, in verse 19, Thou shalt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. The branches here, again, is the Hebrew nation or the Israelite nation. Now, not every Israelite was broken off or cut off. Here we, we know that some of them were being regrafted in, okay? As we see again in Acts chapter 2, okay? We see that that ingathering came in, and we see that as Yahshua came on the scene, as they believed in Yahshua, they were being grafted back into the root, okay? This is how Israel, this is how the Hebrew people, the Hebrew nation who have been called out to say cross over, which is what Hebrew means, to cross over the Euphrates, to come out from among the Babylonian system, all right, that God would now choose you to be a light to the Gentiles, okay, and by you being grafted in, all right, back into that olive tree, which is Yahshua, which is Yahshua, this is how they were being plugged back in. And then the Holy Spirit coming on the inside seals them as sons of God because now they have the spirit breath, the DNA of God, and now they are sons of God and they're being grafted back in. So, so Paul is declaring this and he's making this plain to those who are enrolled, all right, to the Jew and the Gentile or to the Judeans, all right, and the Gentile or the tribe of Judah and the Gentiles, okay? Now, let's keep moving, let's keep moving. He says, what, uh, thou, will, what uh, thou will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. And then he goes on to verse 20. He says, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. Again, he's telling the Gentiles, he said, don't be high-minded. Don't be high. Don't get lifted up. Okay. And he's going to tell you why you shouldn't get lifted up. Okay. And he says the only reason why they were cut off or broken off. And we're going to talk about branches in a little bit. And what happened with branches. All right. That are not producing fruit. That, that happens to be broken off. What are they good for? We're going to see what Yahshua says about this in just a few moments. Stick with me. Watch this. He says, for if God spared not the natural branches, that's 21, verse 21 in Romans 11, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He says, you are standing by faith. He's telling the Gentiles, you are standing. In other words, you are grafted in by faith. By faith in who? By faith in Messiah. And then he says, well, wait a minute, don't boast though. Don't get high-minded because the moment you start boasting against the tree, against the branch, he says, he lets them know just as they were broken off, you too can be broken off. Watch him now. He says, if he didn't spare the natural branches, Hebrew Israelites were natural branches. In other words, they were brought up with the root of the tree. In other words, when the root being God himself, being Yahshua, okay, when God began to bring forth a people, these people were connected to God, okay? When he began to bring forth a nation through Abraham, in this case, now, they were connected to Abraham, right? through the loins of Abraham. And so this is why they are connected naturally, 
because God had already established them through Abraham that he would bless them and that they will be his people and that he will be our God. We will be his people and he definitely is my God or would be our God. Now watch this. He goes on to verse 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. What is the goodness? The goodness is the faith that the Gentiles take hold of in Messiah. That's the goodness of God that he will allow you to come in. All right. He didn't have to. He had already chose them. And he says, there is no other nation that I love but you. And Yahshua came and said, look, I came only to the house of Israel. But when people begin to operate in faith, my God, faith is the key into Messiah. And therefore, everyone must have faith in Messiah to stay plugged in. That's going to be very key. And we're going to talk about because faith is a, it's a powerful, powerful key to keep that door unlocked. But if you lose that key, that door is not going to open up for you as it relates to eternity, as it relates to you getting connected to Messiah, as it relates to you receiving the blessings of the covenant, the faith key is the door key to all of the things that's connected to the covenant in Messiah. Lose that faith key, you lose the access into everything that comes with it. The covenant, the blessings, everything is lost. We're going to talk about it. Watch this. Otherwise, thou shalt be cut off. What? He says, of them which fail severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou, he says, if thou continue in goodness or in faith, otherwise thou also shall be cut. Wait a minute. I thought once saved, always saved. See, you can be cut off too. So don't boast, Gentiles. Don't boast about your connection and your uh, uh, faith connection to Messiah because the moment you lose that key of faith and faith, watch this, faith without works is dead faith. And that is the main thing when it comes to Christianity, at least what is being taught. There's nothing for you to do. There's no work that we do. We're saved by faith and faith alone, right? And see what is happening is they miss understand Paul's writing and Paul brother Peter says people misunderstand Paul's writing they twist his writings thinking that Paul says okay we shouldn't we don't have to work no when it comes to salvation you don't Jesus has already worked it Jesus has already laid his life down he lived perfectly so we wouldn't necessarily have to in the sense of working for salvation because we couldn't do it perfectly. In order for salvation to be brought to us, Yahshua had to do this perfectly. He had to live perfectly. Why? Because he had to be a sinless lamb. No lamb that would be offered, even in the old covenant, could have any type of blemishes. That's why God is coming back for a church without a spot, wrinkle, or blemish. The only way he's going to find a church without a spot, wrinkle, or blemish, it has to be under the blood of Yahshua and be be sprinkled by the blood of Yeshua. That doesn't mean that we don't pursue righteousness. It doesn't mean that we don't pursue works. That's why the Bible says, I'm looking for laborers to go out into the harvest field. That means God is looking for us to work. That, that The Bible says, we're going to get into fruit. You can't produce fruit if you ain't on a tree and that tree has to produce. And if you're not producing, we're going to find out here shortly that you can be cut off because fruits are connected to faith. Got me? Fruit, fruits are connected to your faith because when fruits are being produced, that means you are working your faith. All right, watch this now. Let's keep going. Let's keep going and read this last verse, verse 23. It says, and they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Now he's talking about the Hebrews or the Israelites or the Jews, all right? And and we're talking about, I'm not talking about 
uh, necessarily the Jews that we have already noted, noted as Jews. I'm talking about those Jews that God has established with Abraham, born through Abraham, okay? I'm not talking about those Jews, as Revelation says, who claim to be Jews and are not. I'm talking about the original Jews at the time that this was right was written, okay? Now, <clears throat> so let's let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, uh, let's go to. I tell you what. Let's go to Matthew chapter seven. Matthew chapter seven, and verse nineteen is going to be our focus. But let's start at verse fourteen. He says, "But straight." Now again, this is Joshua talking. You all. He says, "Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it." Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are waver, uh, uh, ravening uh, wolves. You should know, here we go, we're getting into this fruit thing now. All right, you should know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes and thorns or figs or thistles? All right, it says, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Okay, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. The, in other words, Yahshua is looking for fruit. Now, he said, depending on what type of tree you are, that's what you're going to produce. All right, and understand a tree is of its roots, that's the key. Whatever the root, or let's go, it, let's go farther. Whatever the seed is, is what he's really saying. Whatever the seed is, is what that tree is supposed to produce. Okay. He says, a good tree cannot bear evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that beareth not, or bringeth, I'm sorry, verse 19, which is our key verse in this particular passage, Matthew 7. He says, every tree that bringeth not for good fruit is hewn down and did what? Cast into the fire. Every tree that bringeth not for good fruit is hewn down and cast into the lake of fire. Now, here's, I don't know if you caught the shift that was made here. First, Jesus was talking about good tree. Then he's talking about corrupt trees. And then he gets to verse 19. He just he just put it all out there. He says, every tree, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. There are many type of trees out here, you all. Okay, many type of trees, right? So, but we know there's only one tree that can produce. I'm talking about in the sense of Yahshua when we're connected to him. That is the tree that can produce good fruit. Now, we know there are people that are connected to many things out here, and sometimes they may produce good things. They may have good fruit coming from them, all right? But you have to be connected to the right tree. That's why Jesus said, you know what? Every tree, because there are many trees. There's a tree of good and evil, right? <laughs> we know that. That's, that's a tree of... That one tree is a tree of good and evil. There's a tree of life, right? Okay. And he says, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. All right. So now watch this. He's going to take this father. Watch what he says. Let's go to Hebrews chapter six. And we're going to focus at verse eight. It says, for it is impossible for those who was once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, all right? Partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, all right? So that means they have experienced, all right, the powers of the world to come. They have experienced the Holy Ghost. Now, you know, when you experience the Holy Ghost, and the heavenly gift, he says, you've been enlightened, 
all right? You, en enlightened means that there's some revelation that has been given to you concerning, all right, God, concerning, let's just say the Godhead. Okay, it says heavenly gifts, okay? You have some connection or had some understanding of the spiritual gift. You've been partakers or associated with the Holy Ghost, right? You have uh, had interactions with the, the, the word of God and the powers of the world that is to come. That means eternity, the new heaven and the new earth. Maybe you have tasted that, you experienced that. He says, basically what he's saying is, if you have experienced these things, let's just listen. You've been enlightened, number one. That means you received some revelation, okay, concerning, let's just say, the Godhead. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift okay and were made partakers of the holy ghost okay so i believe the heavenly gift uh heavenly uh the heavenly gift again what is the heavenly gift i believe the heavenly gift is none other than the holy spirit that's the gift from god all right i believe salvation is a gift from god that's why the bible says what does the bible say he says it is the gift of god all right your salvation because of faith is a gift from God, okay? So you have experienced this. You have tasted it, okay? And he says, you're partakers. You've been enlightened. Okay, so that's three things. And then he says, tasted the good word of God and the powers of five things, all right? You have experienced. And then watch what he says in verse six. If they shall fall away, if they, that's a possibility. The word if is simply telling us it's a possibility to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they have crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So let's just let's look at it this way. He says, if they shall fall away, seeing they have crucified. So I, what I did is says to renew them again to repentance. So if you if you pause that part where it says to renew them again unto repentance, if you take that and just pause that section, and if you take if they should fall away, seeing how, in other words, how do they fall away? How do they fall away? Because they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh, putting him to an open shame. Okay, how did they do that? How did they do that? How did they crucify him again? Look. When you accept Yahshua, he, he's been crucified for you. He's alive now. So you believe that he died for you. He resurrected for you. He's sitting at the right hand of God for you. So he's no longer dead, all right, in the sense of this crucifixion being buried in the grave, but he's resurrected, right? He's sitting at the right hand of God. He's alive. But seeing they crucified to themselves, the son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. How did they do that? That apparently, remember, they must have did what Peter said, turn back to their vomit, turn back to their slop, right? And watch what it says again in verse seven. It says, for the earth, which quick, no, let's skip that. It said, for, well, I'll just go ahead and read it. But verse eight is what I want you to see. It says, for the earth, which drinketh in the rain that cometh often upon it and bring it forth herds meet for them by whom it is dressed receive blessings from God and then it goes on it says but that which beareth thorns and bears is rejected remember we just read that before we just read that before now about these thorns okay and we read that <clears throat> and uh in Jesus in Matthew chapter 7. All right. We read that in Matthew chapter 7 as it relates to uh, uh, verse 16. But moving on, but moving on, he says this in verse 8. In verse 8 in Hebrews 6, it says, But that which beareth thorns and bears is rejected. In other words, what is he saying? He says the rain comes. In other words, the Bible says that the word of God is like rain. And when it falls, it's supposed to produce. 
Now, if God has sent the word to you, now let's go back. If you tasted the word, which is the rain that is coming down, but yet you reject it, you crucify him all over again because you go back to the vomit. You go back to your old ways. You go back to the old sinful self. In other words, you go back to that old nature, that old Adam nature who had ate off the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. You are going to produce thorns and thistles, right? You got to. That's what. That's what happened with Adam when he ate of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. He says the earth now is going to produce thorns, right? It's going to produce thorns, and you're not going to get what you would normally get from the earth. So that's what's happening to you if you turn to God. That's what happens to us if we don't turn to God and we turn away from him instead of staying, sticking with him and enduring, right? That our names can stay written in the Lamb's book of life. That means what has happened is we rejected it and is now unto cursing who in is to be burned. Now we know that that burning, he's talking about hell. That's what he's talking about. So we see the writer of Hebrews talks about hell. We see Peter talks about hell. We see Yahshua talks about you should be burned. Okay. We see God saying that your name is going to be blotted out. Now if your name is blotted out, you know you can't go nowhere but one place. If your name is not in the book of life, then it's going to be somewhere else. It's in the book of the dead, not the book of life. Okay, now let's move on. Let's move on, but that's not his will for us. Now, let's go to Yahshua one more time. Here's another verse in John chapter 15 when he talked about the vine and the branches. He goes, he, he, he's still on this branch and this fruit, all right? which is again, very important. In John chapter 15, verse two, he says, every branch, now watch this so you can see, Yahshua says, every branch in me. So that means he's talking about individuals, people that are in him. Every branch in me that bear it not fruit, he take it away. Every branch in me that bear it not fruit. This is John 15, 2. He taketh away. Okay. And then he says, every branch that beareth fruit. Again, this is the branch that's in him. So we got a branch in him that's not bearing fruit. That's not bearing fruit. And then there's branches in him that's bearing fruit. Now here's what he says. If you're bearing fruit, he says, I'm gonna purge you. I'm gonna purge you that I may bring forth more fruit. But if you're in me and you're not producing nothing, he's gonna tell you what's gonna to happen to you as well. Now he, he, he saves that to later on in the passage, but he just tells you straight out right here and with no strings attached. He says, if, again, every branch I want to, I want, I said if, but there's no if here in the King James Version. There's no if. So I said if, but there's no if. John 15, 2. He says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And then you see a semicolon there, meaning, hold on. I got some more to add to this. And he says, every branch that beareth fruit, he purge it that it may bring forth much fruit. Now, what is he gonna do with those who are not producing fruit though? Wait a minute, I'm in Messiah though. Everything's good, right? I don't have to do anything, right? I don't have to produce any fruit. Surely I don't have to produce any fruit. Why? Jesus producing all the fruit, right? Well, let's just see what Jesus' own words. Let's see what he says. This is his own words. Let's skip down first and foremost. All right, to verse six. And look at what he says in the same passage. He says, if a man abide not in me. Now he's telling you, that means your branch. Again, he's the tree or he's the, he's the vine. We're connected to him. That means if we're plugged in, just like Paul was talking about, you know, being grafted in, right? 
Here's what Jesus says in the same notion. He says, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. They are burned. So we see again, we see this burning mechanism. We see this burning connection. And we know he's referring to hell. I know y'all don't want to hear that. I know you don't. But he's talking about hell. He's given us a parable. Maybe I should say it's a parable as it relates to what happened to vines when they are cut. It's a earthly parable with a hell result as the meaning. Now let's move on. Let's move on. Let's see what Paul has to say because apparently people who have faith, but yet they ain't working that faith. In other words, I'm in Messiah, but I ain't doing nothing with it. I'm in Messiah, but I ain't doing nothing with it. I believe in Messiah. You know, in other words, so many people say, well, I believe in God. How many people you've heard, how many people you've talked to who said, you know, you, you're trying to share the gospel of Yahshua with them and you're trying to get them to accept Messiah and they'll tell you, well, I already believe in God. I already believe in him, you know? Well, a lot of people believe, even the Bible says, even the devil or Satan believes and trembles. But guess what? He ain't working. He ain't working for God. He's working against God. Although he know God is real, he know God exists. How? Because God is the one created him. But he's not pr producing any fruit for God. And guess what happened? He was cut off from eternity in the sense of living with God, being in the space of God. All right. And we know the end result is going to be the lake of fire. And anything that was once attached to God that turns from him, Lucifer is an example of what happens to a person that is connected. That, look, let me give you a good example. Lucifer tasted the good word of God, right? He experienced the heavenly gift, correct? He experienced that, right? He knows all about it, in other words. He knows about the Holy Ghost. He knows about the word, right? He, he has enlightenment. But guess what? Guess what? He didn't stick with what he knew. He didn't stick with the plan of God, or let's just say the destiny for his life. So he was cut off. And therefore now he's wrecking heaven on the earth and in the realm of the air or in the realm of the spirit in the spirit realm of darkness, the Bible talks about, and that realm is principalities and powers of rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places, right? He's the God of this world. And he has many kingdoms to offer people. He's the God of entertainment. He's the God of economics. He's the God, hear me, of, 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 of technology. He's the God of, of the Food and Drug Administrations. He's the God of all of that stuff, okay? And therefore, he's the God of the Babylonian system that is spread out all over this nation, all over the nations of the world. So, with that being said, moving on. So, he didn't stay attached. He got thrown out. And anybody that don't stay attached can have their names blotted out and be thrown out and disconnected, cut off and burned. I know that's the severity and the goodness of God. All right, let's keep moving. It says, now I beseech you, 2 Thessalonians chapter two. Matter of fact, let's just go straight to the word. Let's go straight to this. Verse three, it says, let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come, right? For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that the man of sin be revealed. Now you can't fall away from something if you want once attached to it. You cannot fall away. Now again, this is Paul talking about the falling away from 
the attachment of faith to Messiah, to the kingdom of God. Okay? <clears throat> so we know that's what he's talking about. Because he goes on and he says, Who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is he as God seated in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, if I continue, which I want, uh, but if you can go on, you'll see that many people are going to be turned over to a great delusion because they refuse to believe the truth and they rather believe a lie. Now, watch what Paul says in relationship to this. He's still talking here, and let's go to 2 Timothy. I mean, 1 Timothy, rather. Verse, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. He says, now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, and I will, I will definitely say we are in the latter times, shall depart from the faith. And this is the same Paul that was talking in 2 Thessalonians to the Thessalonians. And he's saying to now to Timothy, all right, that, hey, Timothy, understand this, that there is going to be a falling away. Now, let's back up. Because I don't know if you all caught this. If you look at this closely, look at this closely. He says, now the spirit. Remember I said God, Yahshua, or let's just say the Godhead, Yahweh Elohim. Okay. Uh, some people pronounce Yahqua, all right, or uh, Yahuwah, all right. Elohim. We're talking about Yahshua, or some people would say Yahshua, okay, or Yahweh Shai, okay. So we got their perspective. We got God's perspective in Exodus. We got Yahshua's perspective, all right, in the Gospels. We got some of the apostles' perspective, and we're getting Apostle Paul's perspective continually now through what he was impressed upon by the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is giving us. So the Godhead are all in alignment. In other words, they're in agreement. All right? That people are going to fall away. People can be cut off. Names can be blotted out. All right? So this once saved, always saved notion is false. Not me saying it, the Godhead is saying it. It's not me. Now, again, I know there will be many to come. So what about this scripture? What about that scripture? This scripture said this and that scripture said this. Okay, let's just do this. Let's finish reading this real quick. It says, now the spirit speaketh expressly that in a lot of times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Okay giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So how are people going to turn? Because devilish spirits or evil spirits, just like Lucifer, that turned from God. So there will be spirits that have turned from God, right? Spirits, demons, all right, that have turned, all right, that are going to influence people to turn away from the faith. Now, there is a video that's out right now where people are renouncing all right y'all this made the news now check this out Put the Well, Neil Casey, despite the rain, East Texas Christians wanted to take this time to get even closer to God by standing at the square where tomorrow's events will be held. As it poured, East Texans prayed. I wanted to get a group of people together to go down before the event tomorrow and just pray and exercise our freedom of religion. Church of the Pines member Lauren Etheridge Langis, along with others, came out to praise God before a satanic temple comes to town. As a Christian, she says she was called to do this. I do have a difference of belief, so rather than go and confront them, I'm just going to do my job as a Christian and just 
pray over that and pray for the souls that are there. Churches from all over the area came to stand together with some groups sitting in their cars to pray nearby too. As a Christian, we're called to a spiritual battleground and I think this is an opportunity to exercise our strength in our relationship with Christ. Wow church members say they were unaware of the prayer gathering but still felt called to invite pastors to the square after hearing about the upcoming event. We didn't come down to be combative, didn't come down to bash anybody's religion, but we wanted to stand as believers and pray. It's a way for these East Texas churches to stand together in their faith, some even walking around the square blessing the area as the rain fell. Anytime the rain does not stop the believers from gathering, I'm always happy. I'm always happy. Sending a message of love and peace to what's coming next. Regardless of what your belief is, regardless of what you've been through, your love is. We don't hate you because God is love. And Langa says she expects there would be some church groups that will show up tomorrow to confront these visitors, but she chose to pray the day before. Live in studio, Lauren Margolis, KTK News. Okay, now we're going to watch this and see. As you can see, and they're renouncing. Look at the kids. Say you want to bother Christians, okay? You know, really, they know not what they do, to be honest, you all. There have been many people who come out of this type of conditional situation, mindset, who have given their hearts, their soul, their life to the Lord. So some of these people are hurt, like like this one. Listen. She said God didn't protect her when she was being a bruise. So, so they go that way. So I guess if they are abused with Satan, I guess he's protecting them. They're going to a Satanist, or let's just say a Satanist priest. And he's putting, I don't know if it's holy water or something, uh, uh, blood. Or, I don't know what he's doing. And I'm going to have to, maybe I need to try to post that video in this video and show you what is happening. People who was once in the faith, right, who once believe in Yahshua, but they're turning from Yahshua, getting marked by the satanic priest or Satan's worshipers or satanic believers getting marked on their forehead, even putting their children through this ritual, and they're turning away from Messiah Yahshua. This is happening right now today. This very verse, we are in a lot of times. So with that being said, you all, so some people might even say, well, what about the scripture that says in John 10, 28, some people will say, well, Jesus says uh, uh, that no man can pluck them out of my hand, right? No man, if he's in my hand, no man can pluck them out. You know what? That's the scripture. Who am I to argue with it? You're exactly right. But do we understand and connect the dots to this scripture? 
Okay. Now Jesus says it, no man can pluck out of my hand. Correct. And not only that, he even goes even farther. He says, no man can pluck you out of God's hand. Again, let's just read it. Let's, let's just read it. It says, and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. And then he goes on to John 10, 29. He says, my father, which gave them me, it's greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. All right. They are in the father's hand. They're in my hand. They cannot be snatched out. Right now. Let me show you something. I want to show you one thing and I'm going to give you something in connection to this. Watch this. Do you remember about seven chapters old in the same book, John, Jesus is giving his last prayer to the father on the behalf of the disciples and those who will believe the words of the disciples. This is in John chapter 17. Now I'll call this chapter the Melchizedek prayer. All right. The priestly you know, order of Melchizedek, you know, of course, Jesus is the order of Melchizedek. He's king and he's the priest. And so he's declaring some things here that he desires that the father would respond and answer to. He's interceding on the behalf of the disciples and those who would believe their gospel, their preaching of his name. All right. And then he talks about the son of perdition in verse 12. Watch what he says here. And I want to I want to show you something. Now, he says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou giveth me, I have kept. In other words, those that you put in my hand, I have kept, right? And I didn't lose none of them. All right, he says, and none of them is lost. That means those of you put in my care, those of you told me would be my disciples, those who you told me would follow me, I kept them. They're in my care. I've kept them. I've lost none. But then he says, but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, this is a powerful verse in relationship to one save, always save, and in relationship to plucking out of my hand. Notice, he says, I kept everything and none of them are lost, but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now watch this. Now if the scripture that we just discussed talks about God himself, including Yahshua says this, that people can be blotted out. That's a scripture, right? People can be blotted out. And we read that in the Psalms 60, we read this also in chapter 32 of Exodus, right? 32, 32 and Exodus 32, 33, the verse. And we read this in Revelation, I believe Revelation three and five, talks about blotting out names. Jesus says it, okay, and God says it, right? So watch this. And he says, and then we come to what we just read in John 10, that no one can pluck, pluck people out of his hand that are in his hand. But then he says, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So if the scripture says that there's going to be a falling away, if the Holy Spirit says people are going to turn from the faith, and if God and Yahshua says that people's names are going to be blotted out or can be blotted out, right? And people can be cut off. People are going to be thrown into the fire because they didn't stay abiding. So that means people made a choice. Watch this. The reason why, why? because the scriptures have to be fulfilled. So the plotting out of names has to be fulfilled. The turning away from the faith, giving heed to the seducing spirits have to be fulfilled. So the people that can't be plucked out are the people that can't be plucked out. That's the goodness and the severity of God. So I will end with that you all. I pray that I've said something and I brought some clarity that perhaps you never heard it this way. 
and that you got an understanding that there's work for us to do. We can't just sit on our do nothing and we're connected to Messiah. We got to get out there in the harvest field and we got to be the light to the world. We got to be the salt in the earth and we got to be the city on the hill. And he's not talking about just go and be a city and sit there. No, a city on the hill that's bringing forth light. That means everybody is looking at how beautiful this city is. Have you ever, have you ever been traveling down down the interstate and you're getting ready to come into a big city you know many times we went to atlanta and we come in there's a certain area when you get ready to come in and i forgot the interstate the number uh the highway uh number or the name we're coming in we're getting ready to come into atlanta and there's a area where you kind of high above and you kind of see all those lights in the distance you can't help but to see it right so those lights are there so you will know that the city is coming up and whoever built that city meaning that the powers that put that city together uh the commissioners and the mayors and the uh uh, the county uh, mayors and all those individuals, the governors of that area and, and those who build and those who are uh, business owners who put that together and want to build these big cities, they, they wanted this thing to be seen, right? And so we can just look at that throughout the nation of the United States or out the nations of the world where these big cities are, man, they're like beacons and flashing lights. But the Bible also said you need to be a light. You need to be a candle should not be put up on the bush, but on the tabletop, right? So everything in the house can be seen. Salt is a preservative, right? It's a preservative. It's something that prolongs life. So again, if we're going to be laborers, there's work to do in the harvest field. The Bible says, go forth, make disciples, right? Make disciples. Those who will follow you, will follow you unto the Messiah. And we introduce them to the Messiah that they may be followers of Messiah. Okay, so there's work for us to do, to live holy, to live righteous. Yes, Yahshua was holy. Yes, Yahshua was righteous, right? We're not going about to establish our own righteousness, right? We're not. Why? Because Yahshua has already established that righteousness and we follow that righteousness. We don't go about to establish our own holiness, right? Which many people have done. They've added to the scripture and they said, this is what holiness is. This is what it looks like. But see, the fact that you connect to Yahshua, yes, you are holy, right? The fact that you're connected to Yahshua, you are righteous. The fact that you're connected to Yahshua, you are godly. And the Holy Spirit comes to empower that holiness, to empower that righteousness, to empower the truth in you that comes through Messiah, to empower the word of God that you may live it now. Now that you may live righteous, that you may live holy, that you may live God-likeness in the earth. All right? With that being said, Father, in the name of Yeshua, I pray for those that have heard me tonight. Father, I pray in the name of Yeshua that every demonic spirit that have been releasing this, this diabolical plot and scheme against the body of Messiah to make them feel like there's nothing for them to do. But yes, I believe, but there's no work to be done. There is no fruit to be produced. Father, in the name of Yeshua, Father, break off the blindness over their brains, over their you said in your word that they have been, their minds have been blinded. Father God, that take the blinders off of their minds. Now, it's one thing to be blind with the eyes. And that's one thing, to be blind in the physical sense. But there's another type of blindness where the mind is blind. That means you can see with your eyes. But your mind has been clouded over to whereby the revelation and the understanding of God, the insight, right? The enlightenment, the knowledge, the wisdom of God that we just read is incapable of you of understanding. The knowledge is hid from you. Father, in Yeshua's name, shed light now. Break light into that dark place. Take the callousness off. Take that uh, the the cast off of their eyes, Father God. Take the beam and the moat out of the eyes, out of the eyes of the spirit, out of the eyes of the soul, that they may be able to see, 
Father God, that there is a truth to being in Messiah and producing fruit. Father, in Yahshua's name, in Yahshua's name, reveal this to them and let them begin to walk in a lifestyle, Father God, of the kingdom of God. Not in the lifestyle of the culture of this world, but in the culture of the kingdom. In Yahshua's name, we declare it to be so right now that you will come to know him in the power and the forgiveness of your sin, yes, and that you will go on to know the Lord in a real powerful and tangible way that you are walking in the kingdom of God in a real way that produces fruit in your life. Amen. And again, I pray that every demonic spirit, every demonic attachment that has been assigned against you to give you this false narrative, this false deceptive uh, way that maybe somebody taught you, some uh, religious group have taught you, some religious church have taught you, have come down through all these different so-called uh, uh, religious leaders through throughout time and, you know, have come through the doctrine of the church and that you would hear the voice of God and don't be deceived by this. There's a doctrine that is called predestination that if you've been predestined, it's just, it's sealed. No, no. I'm going to have to even talk about that and reveal there's no, because you have been predestined, you have to choose predestination. It's a choice. Why? Because God giving you a will. All of us has been predestined. All right. All of us have a predestined. It's been rooked. I, our book has been written. Do you know how many people die outside of the wheel of the predestined plan of God? That they were predestined to go a certain way, but they chose to go opposite of that. Give you an example. Cain, when he slew his brother Abel, God even told him, if you read it, he, he tells him, look, he says, sin lies at the door, but you can overcome it. You can resist it. He was telling him, you can resist this. Sin lies at the door. And if you don't overcome this, it's going to overtake you. Just like we read. Just like we read in the book of Revelation. It will overcome you and overtake you to where you submit yourself to the temptation. And that's what happened with Cain. He submitted himself to the anger and the frustration of the moment. And he slew his brother. And I'm telling you, it can happen to you. It can happen to you if you don't stay connected, prayed up, faithful, walking with the Lord, walking in the light of his countenance, walking in the power of the Holy Ghost. All right. So again, God bless you. I pray that I've said something to encourage you, empower you and give you revelation and understanding. Once saved, always saved. It's not true. All right. Once saved, always saved. Uh, once saved, always saved. is not true. If you don't stay connected to the branch, and if you don't produce fruits, your name can be blotted out and you can be cut off from the vine. You can be cut off from the root of the olive tree and be cast into the fire. That's not for you. The Bible says it in Matthew 25, and I believe it's verse 41. He made hell for the devil and his angels. Not for you. God bless you. Amen.